I don't know how long we intended to do it. And I asked you to do it. I asked you to do it a, because you're like one of my best friends and, <laughs> and then, yeah. And B like, you seem like you knew a lot more about podcasting than me. Like you like listened to a lot of more podcast. You used to have a podcast. I won't say its name. I won't like, I won't pull like a, what you pulled on me with my book and say you're out podcast him name. out him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Adam used to have a podcast and I was a guest on it once. I re-listened to that episode to see if there was anything worth like saving from it. Absolutely nothing. Total garbage. Aww. Even when I told the story about when I was uh, almost arrested. Yeah. None of it was, <laughs> none of it was noteworthy. <laughs> we thought it was a lot more interesting than it really was. The whole, the whole podcast. Yeah. Anyways. I don't remember. Do you remember wh- at what point we got past the pr- the point where it made sense as a press cycle and we're just still doing it? And because we were doing it for its own sake? It was pretty early on because we, we immediately started getting good guests. Yeah. And we were having these like in-depth conversations. And really, I feel like the Tim Capello one was the moment that had us buzzing And being like, wow, like this is exciting. And if we can talk to this guy about Ska, like we can talk to anybody about Ska. Because like to us, he was just this fictional character from this movie. And there was so much more depth to him. um, And we found that out. Mm -hmm. So I think that was, that was kind of the moment for me. And I remember we talked for like a week straight. Like we were both just like really hype on how well that episode went. Yeah, that was an interesting one because I was still writing articles. I stopped writing articles for the newspapers a couple of years ago. Yeah. But I was still writing and I was writing for Good Times and Tim Capello, like, play, like, I saw that he was playing the Blue Lagoon in Santa Cruz. And I was like, and the Blue Lagoon is like a dive bar. I mean, no offense. It's, it's a fine venue. It's just like Tim Capello. Like, why is he playing the Blue Lagoon, right? Yeah, yeah. And I couldn't believe that. So I, uh, and I knew, so I knew people that worked there and I was like, yo, is Tim Capello actually playing the blue lagoon? They're like, yeah. I was like, oh man, I got to do an article for the newspaper. Do you have his contact? And they gave me his contact. This is how I had his contact that we able, that I <laughs> then used for in defense of ska, like sometime later, like a year later. But, um, and I, when I interviewed him, the thing that surprised me was that he had not played Santa Cruz since the lost boys saying and it was it was so not a big deal like it should have been a huge deal that he was doing his return to santa cruz after you know decades like he defined that film and like this whole santa cruz like aesthetic too you know what i mean like i don't see why he wasn't headlining catalyst to like thousand people yeah or playing on the bandstand at at the boardwalk at least or playing. Yeah, like exactly. And, and I interviewed him and you know, when you do an article, when, so when you're writing for like the newspaper and it's like a one page, like 750 word article, 20 to 30 minutes is fine. You're going to get enough quotes, right? Him and I talked for like an hour. Yeah. And he told me so many stories that I couldn't use in the article because it just, it was just too much of a tangent. And I was like, oh my God, I would love, I would love to talk to this guy. Just go all in on this guy and just get all the stories. So yeah, I think, I think I was, I had that thought process went through my head when we were doing the podcast and it was getting more like, we're just looking for guests. Then how, how long did that episode end up being? Two and a half hours, I think. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Two and a half hours. How long did it take to set up? 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was having sound issues. Yeah. We had to work him through that. I was glad he didn't give up. I was afraid he was going to rage quit, and he didn't. When I, 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 pitched the, I pitched it to him, you know, because I, hey, this is Aaron. I interviewed you like a year ago for Good Times. I said, I have this podcast, Ska podcast. Would you like to do it? He's like, I don't know. I don't really know anything about Ska. I was like, it's it's fine. We don't even need to talk about ska. We could. I just want to hear your stories. He's like, okay, cool. And then he comes on, and he has like an encyclopedia knowledge of like Jamaican ska. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, you don't think about ska at all, right? Maybe he studied. The other fun part was we reached out to all these ska musicians and got oh yeah, like a bunch of sax players, and got and they all knew who he was, yeah. of course. Yeah. 
And so they all had like very specific questions for him. Yeah. And that was really fun. That was, that was a good, we, we hadn't really done many bits like that before. I, in our early years, we did, we did try like some random things like that, that we haven't since really replicated. Yeah. You know, you're figuring things out. Yeah. So the new, the new version of the book, I remember when you were working on it, you, you had, uh, brought up all these ideas for different chapters you wanted to have. And now, as I understand, those those ideas have mostly been relegated to a single chapter at the end of the book, correct? Yeah. Oh, so oh, to, to answer your question more thoroughly before. Oh, sure. Doing the podcast has affected the, the second edition in that it's been expanding my own knowledge of the topic. So in some ways mm-hmm. that are very directly related to the book, like we've had I mean, like one, for instance, is we had Jay Navarro on the podcast early on and him and I interviewed for the book and we kind of had a pretty, you know, clear narrative about his story in the book. So I, I kind of re, I kind of like used that narrative for our podcast interview when we had him on as the basis and, but he expanded on it more in that interview than in the book. Yeah. So I feel like that's happened many times. Like we've had, yeah. we've had people on the podcast that I interviewed for the book and because I already know their story from having done all the research for the book, it's like, then it becomes like it, it, like we're building off of it instead of just rehashing it. Right. Yeah. And then there's people that were not in the book, but you can easily see how they're connected. Like their their stories connect in some way. So it's like we're building all of this stuff. So I feel like all of this building we've been doing with the podcast, it kind of, it added to how I wanted to build to the book. So I, I did a lot of, I did do some new interviews specifically for the book, but I also like took a lot of stuff from the podcast itself. Like I took quotes from the podcast and I'd ask people, do you mind if I use this quote in the book, you know, you, you in my second edition? And they're like, sure. Like I, I took like some of the most ridiculous quotes that I used for the second edition was like, I took a John Darnell quote mountain goats just cause he had like this, he had like just the best, like most beautiful, like way to talk about a uh, Goldfinger song, Superman and what like made that song compelling. And I thought that I'm just, I was like, I'm going to put this in here. I'm just going to like, let him say what's great about this song because like who would, why would anyone writing a ska book be like, I'm going to throw it to John, Gar- John Darnell. Let him explain the song. It's just, I would never reach out to John Darnell specifically for that. That makes no sense, but right. Because of the podcast, you have that. Yeah. And there was another one I had where um, we did an episode with Kyle Kinane, the comedian. And that dude like grew up in um, Chicago suburbs and he went to punk and ska shows. And so of course he went to fireside bull all the time. And I, I kind of didn't have anything on Fireside Bowl, the first edition, but I definitely like corrected that in the second edition. I had a whole, whole section where I talk, talk about slapstick story because it, it, it relates. And I talk about Fireside Bowl. And so he has, a, I'd used one of his quotes about Fireside Bowl. It's m- mostly him just making a joke about how there's no stage, there's no separator. And because of that, Uh, He always used to worry like a mom about someone, someone like a horn player, like hurting their teeth or something. It's basically a whole bit about that. It was really funny. Like we, we all like kind of like went on for like 15 minutes on that episode about like the dangers of being a horn player in a ska punk band, (laughs) which, yeah, well, I, that, that was actually a moment for me when we had this podcast where I realized like part of like what I didn't like about like a lot of the way ska was joked about in, in movies and TV shows was that it always felt like the jokes weren't coming from people that like ska. Yeah. Like that seemed to be like the baseline of it. Like whether they're good jokes or bad jokes or making fun of ska or not making fun of ska just seemed like people on the outside don't understand the subculture trying to make jokes about it. And then like, you'd like talking to Kyle Kinane who grew up going to these shows and he's doing like 15 minute bit on like the dangers of being a horn player in a ska punk band. It's like, that's a joke that comes from within. Like you don't make that joke unless you come from that subculture. You don't understand like, yeah, you're playing these punk shows and horn players are full on trombone saxophones with reeds in their mouth. Like while kids are moshing around, like that's a very specific 
aspect to the subculture. Yeah. 